Uh, well, my favorite part of the book is the front cover, which has my daughters on it. And they inspired me to write the book. I have, for many years, written about children's issues in the context of philosophical literature on children's rights. Um, and in recent years, that literature presupposes that children are of equal moral status or equal in a moral sense to adults. And I joined with that assumption against the historical background that children occupied an inferior status. And one day, or several days, just looking at my girls, uh, full of life, full of engagement with the world, uh, I felt some envy and it occurred to me that perhaps they are <clears throat> in some morally relevant way better than I am, uh, in part because of these qualities that they have, uh, including their engagement with the world, but also their uh, physical capabilities. Uh, my body and my senses are declining while theirs are uh, so vibrant uh, and strong. And I delved into the philosophical literature on moral status and increasingly came to believe I could actually make a plausible argument that uh, if one has a well-developed theory of moral status, you would actually conclude that children come out ahead of us. Yeah, an unusual aspect of the book for a work on uh, moral status and moral philosophy is its incorporation of psychological research, consulting the way our brains actually work when we, uh, as a matter of practice, ascribe moral status to other beings, I think is worth investigating. With so much of moral status uh, matters is taken for granted. We just assume all adults are of equal status. Today we sort of assume children are, but these questions come up, right? So in the abortion debate, um, an underlying question that never gets fleshed out much is what really is the moral status of a fetus? It's Kantians, um, but people in everyday life might also have this view that uh, what matters is uh, certain rational capacity. Um, but then they have to explain babies, right? Because we assume that babies are persons in a sense. You can't just do whatever you want to them. They have rights against violence and so forth. Uh, the way out of that is to, uh, out of that dilemma and others, like the moral status of adults in a coma, uh, many people think animals, non-human animals, have moral status of some sort, have, have rights. How do you explain all that if all you think that matters is autonomy? And the competing view, which is typically advanced by the animal rights folks, is it's not autonomy at all, it's sentience. Uh, it's the ability to feel pleasure and pain. That's what matters. All animals have it, so they all have some moral status. Um, I maintain that if you look at the way our moral brains operate, we do both of these things. The next step of the analysis is to say, recognize that all of these things can vary in degree. And so we might say fetuses have some, but not as much as, as a person after birth. Uh, persons in a coma have some, but perhaps not equal. Dogs and cats have some, but perhaps not the same as human beings. In terms of uh, policy and legal conclusions, uh, it's permissible to subordinate the interests of adults to those of children. So if you imagine any situation where there are trade-offs to be made, adults and children have pretty much equal interests at stake, it would be requisite, morally, uh, to favor the children over the adults. Uh, and that could be true with spending from the public treasury, um, use of public space, uh, in the divorce context, for example, we might say, well, divorcing couples have to create a home for their children, one home, uh, and the adults have to rotate. Yes, uh, my younger daughter actually picked up the book when I brought it home a couple weeks ago and started reading it and skipped quickly to the conclusions, what should follow from children's superiority, superiority and sort of quizzing me on a few things about whether I was complying with my own <laughs> conclusions. And...